Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, producer and drummer with Melissa Etheridge, Brian Delaney, and now, Rich Redman. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from... A lot of cities today, New York, <laughs> L.A., and Nashville, the last Ooh. three places for the creative arts in this United States of America. But hey, we're going to have a great time today, as always, joined by my sidekick, co-producer, co-host, good pal from all these years, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Jim, what is up in Nashville today? What's happening, man? Oh, it's beautiful. Just got back from a camping trip. Oh, yeah. You do that on the weekends. You have a life. You have hobbies. Good for you. I do. <laughs> I try to. <laughs> you know, I'm getting into this building ships in a bottle thing. Now, people always ask, what are your hobbies, Rich? Wow. I tell you what, I did an interview this morning, and then I said, I got to get my workout in while the sun is shining. Of course, out here in sunny Los Angeles, it's like sunny and 70. There's not a cloud in the sky, and I'm wondering why people pay $1.2 million for a 900-square-foot home. And that is the reason, because it feels really, really good. So, Jim, let's, we'll catch yes. up off air about the camping and the glamping that you guys do. I saw you don't some want to do it now? <laughs> but, hey, our guest today actually listens to our show. I said, hey, that's Jim. He's like, oh, I know Jim. So, yeah, Jim, you have fans. I think you're probably needing like, I know Jim. I don't know why you have him you on. You need your own you. T-shirt at some point. But uh, today's guest, not only yes, did we go gym. to college together back in the day at the what? famed University of North Texas, where you can get a degree in jazz, much like getting a degree in philosophy, same application. <laughs> we'll learn a little bit about that today. But today's guest, since 1994, has been a staple of the New York music scene. He's played with folks like Buster Point, Dexter, Lucy Woodward, the New York Dolls, David Johansson, Wu-Tang, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Patty Austin, Michael wow. Brecker, the list goes on and on. Of course, I saw him about five years ago at the Greek Theater with Melissa Etheridge. Amazing show. Our friend Brian Delaney. What's up, pal? What's up? Wow. It's been too long, right? It, way too long. I mean, because we, you know, we're in school together. We're like chasing this drum dream. This is going back many, many years, the early 90s. Everybody moves to New York. I mean, we're talking you, the Jim Whites. You moved with our friend Henry Hay. You go up there, start making your Big Apple dreams come true. And then somehow, 25 years go by. Exactly. I'm yeah. reconnecting with every. I just hung with Blair yesterday. Remember Blair? Oh, Sinta? I of mean, course. crushing it out here. And it's like, I need a place to record. Can I come record? And he's engineering me. And he's, it's crazy. I saw the Instagram thing. I'm like, isn't this Blair's like name? It, but it's yes. rich. And, I know. But I, I stopped it by a, and had a It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. So, yeah, man, I saw you wow. at, four years ago at the Greek Theater, and I think, I don't know if you were relatively new on the job playing with Melissa Etheridge, but I am a Melissa, at, speaking of Blair, Blair played with her as well, had a stint, yep. played on some of her recordings, um, and this is what we do. We pass gigs around here in the UNT drum community. Yep. Um, but I, it was an amazing show, and you guys had the double drum solo together, and I got to hang out with you a little bit backstage. We had a glass of wine. Um, first time I had been backstage at the Greek Theater. You remember that show? It was fun. I do. I'm trying to remember specifics, but it's like an outdoor kind of amphitheater thing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite, it's like right, it's a little smaller than the Hollywood Bowl, but it's got that still that outdoor cool atmosphere where you're looking into the, the stars. <laughs> the stars of LA. Yeah, I, rem <laughs> I mean, how long did I do that gig? Like three years and, you know, you go on the road for couple months you're home for a few months and after a while and i'm sure you know this it just you lose track of what's what and yeah i talked to someone recently and i'm like yeah i saw you in florida right and they're like no that was kansas city i saw you it was i'm like okay sure i like it when I, the fans have better a better memory than you and it makes you yeah. say to yourself man i've been on a tour bus since 1997 I should have journaled more. I should have, yeah. you know. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I mean, I've taken so many flights to Europe. I mean, talk about fog and landing, and you have no idea what time it is, where you're at. Yeah. Jet lag. Holy moly. Yeah, jet lag can be really rough on the um, 
the couple times that I've gone to Japan, when you come back and it's like, I slept for like 24 hours, like straight. Right. That probably right. doesn't work when you got like a wife and kids and stuff. You got to like, you know, but this was, you know, I was 26 years old and I came back and I was like, I am sleeping for a day. And then apparently right. I was just catch, all caught up, you know. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. But th that seemed like a great gig. And now, now did you guys have a, because um, when you and Melissa have your drum solo, she comes behind you and she had like this, you guys were doing like a Krupa type thing. She's on the floor, Tom, and then you got the rims going and she works her over, way over. Did you guys have it all laid out? Was there a rough template? Maybe rough template is the way to go, but it would be make it up each night. And sometimes she would hit me on the hand on accident. <laughs> It's like, ouch, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was, you know, roughly we would do this and that. But what a blast, you know. Yeah. Now, originally, you going, you going this is the inevitable in all podcasts. We try to avoid it. But you're, you're going back to the beginning. And the question is, why drums? Like, this is St. Louis, right? You're growing up in St. Louis. And you and I started around the same time, about eight years old. We're around the same age. So, right? Yeah, I guess I was in seventh grade, so. Yeah. It's, so what are you? You're like 13 or 12, 12 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was a, you know, that's kind of a late start. Yeah, you know? yeah. Some guys are like, yeah, I was six. or And then you get, you know, some overachievers are like, yeah, I was three years old and, you know. Right, right. Yeah, I, again, St. Louis, suburbia, USA. My parents, not musicians. Two older brothers, not musicians. I don't know why I got into it. I, I remember the sixth grade, like talent show or something. They had there was a band, a cover band there, and I remember they were playing "Crocodile Rock" by Elton John, and I just remember <gasps> nice, really digging it and knowing when the fills were coming. Basically, the four bar, eight bar phrase thing, and I just started playing on the table at home and on the closet and stuff. And then when seventh grade in St. Louis, that's where we lived. That's junior high, seventh grade. And then my mom was like, you know, you should do band. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And she's like, no, why don't you try it? So I did. And that, that's how I got into it. And then she started getting me drum lessons and stuff. And Interesting. Yeah. We, we're, we're similar in the sense that I feel like we had this natural – tendency toward the drums or we were drawn to the drums but my but your mom gave you a little push which is very nice because a lot of people are like let's push her let's push him toward yeah, the flute yeah, or the clarinet yeah, or yeah you know For me it was saxophone yeah yeah why don't you play the sax young yeah. jim yeah. it's you want to you want to play an instrument jimmy yeah which one you want to play drums great here's the saxophone <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah but my old man i think I, they were both my, my parents were like yeah dude you know the drums man check that out like get into that and it's so funny my uh desert island record and also the desert I, the, a record that kind of kicked it all open was elton john's greatest hits volume one wow. so <laughs> benny and the jets crocodile rock saturday night Lollet, daniel uh, wow. amazing yeah. right yeah. and yeah. Yeah. nigel olsen uh, who Little did I know that he would, I would end up being a drummer like Nigel in the sense that I would live to play for the song, you know? Right, right, same, right. Same right. with you. Everything you do is so musical. And I, I remember being, before I went to North Texas to start my master's, there was, uh, there was a, uh, I think, a Wichita Jazz Festival or something like that. And you came with one of the small groups from North Texas, and you had this beautifully tuned little bebop kit, and you had this Dijonette ride, and you were all in black doing your thing. And I was like, who is that guy? Man. How do you remember this stuff? I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can remember that you had a Dijonette ride like yeah, 27 years ago. Yeah. I think I still Blueberry have Blueberry pancakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim had blueberry pancakes. You're no, lucky no, no, if you're no. getting blueberry Saying pancakes you. during the week. I had McDonald's oatmeal this morning. Oh, how was it? It was yeah. good. They make good oatmeal. Yeah, they have good stuff. You got a good. They got a good coffee. This uh, segment of the Rich Redmond Show brought yeah. to you by McDonald's. Oh, McDonald's would be amazing. McDonald's. We're waiting. We're waiting. McDonald's. Oatmeal. Waiting. But but that's that starts wow. your path. And you know what blows me away is when you go to North Texas, you're like you were like um, killing it in the small groups and the jazz and playing the big band. And then you, like many of us, we would go moonlight at night and we would get our groove on playing in top forty bands and playing our in R and B groups and whatever we could cut our teeth on to fill in the gaps from maybe what wasn't happening in North Texas or things where we can actually apply the academic learning stuff to the real world. Right. 
Right. And you were killing it. And then, so you moved to New York, and I'm looking right now, I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that you had a setup like that when you were, uh. when you first moved to New York, because with, were you couch surfing? Did you have a roommate? What was that like? Okay. Your oh first my. day in New York. Oh my God. So, of course, never been to New York before. And it's terrifying. Grew up, yeah, grew up in the Midwest. And I'm moving there <laughs> January of 94. So we, we were driving. It was Henry Hay and I and Jim White all driving up together. Wow, I didn't know that. So, and we, you know, you go through St. Louis on the way to New York. So we stopped there a couple of days. And I know my mom thought I was freaking crazy, you know, because <laughs> she saw the New York you see on television. You know, back then, in the, when we moved there, 42nd Street was not Disney. It was strip clubs. You and know, needles. It, yeah. It was rough. And 94 it was? Yeah, January 94. Yeah, but who cleaned it up? What year? That would have yeah, been Giuliani. Yeah, Giuliani shortly after mm. that. You know. Yeah. But so. I think you were looking at li li looking, living in the post-Koch years, Ed Koch. Yeah, correct. Wow. Jim's our historian. Yeah, apparently. Um, anything else? <laughs> I, I grew up in that area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But so Henry and I, we get, who's the guy? Henry had this contact on doing this like programming gig for karaoke music, which was in Times Square, like 52nd Street or something. Mm -hmm. So... Shortly after we got there, we interviewed to work at this place, and you would program like eight hours a day. <laughs> but it was the Ed, no, yeah, it was in the Ed Sullivan Theater Building mm -hmm. where Letterman did his show. And we could talk about the programming thing. That's another whole gig. But so, were you programming drums? Yeah, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Oh, I get, you know, Henry and I still joke about it to this day. So, but in the basement of the Ed Sullivan Theater building was a drum practice room that Anton had a set in. I see. Because he, he was the drummer on Letterman. And uh, Carlock, no, was he there yet? Now I'm going to confuse things. But a lot of people had it set there. So I was like, hey, can I get a spot here and you get like an hour and a half, three days a week or something. And the guy was like, but if Anton comes in, you got to split. <laughs> I'm like, okay, gotcha, whatever. So, but that was my practice, you know, vibe, you know, so I actually had a practice thing, you know, you would set up the thing at home, the practice pad, and then you would try to play all the sessions you could and, you know, it was yeah. nuts. You know? So, you, so what, were your, what were your techniques for schlepping your drums around New York City? Because oh. we didn't have the zip cars, right, the hourly cars, oh. and we didn't have uh, Uber and Lyft. And so basically you're looking at either the subway or trying to hail a taxi with a full drum set, right? So you got any horror stories or, or tidbits there on, for the uh, gigging New York drummer? Well, so... I did have a car there, of course, got broken into a million times, so you could never leave anything in there. So, and I did a lot of jazz gigs at the beginning, so I would bring the smallest possible kit, and, um, but there were a few times I brought it on the subway. So, we lived <laughs> close to a station, oh my God, just, and I remember playing in the subway with, I think it's Art Blakey's daughter. Wow. A jazz messenger's daughter. Was she like a singer or something? Or? Yeah, a singer. Okay. And I'm still just, stressing out having to lug your gear on the subway. You yeah. wouldn't believe. Oh, my God. So I, It stresses me out to see these guys on, down on Broadway in Nashville and how they got to move their gear in and out. I'm like, I, uh, well, done. that used to be a lot easier, but now that, now that it's uh, basically um, – a place for sorority and fraternity parties and bachelorette parties. It's like impossible to get the musicians to load their gear into the clubs. Oh. It, yeah, right. It's so restrictive now. So, so right. what you meet this gal and she goes, I'm a singer. I guess who my dad was and break out those brushes. Cause we're going to jam right now. Yeah. I, I don't know what the hookup was, but Evelyn Blakey was her name. 
Wow. And I don't, and she seemed to be pretty old then. Um, so I don't know if she's still around, but we, so we played like standards on the subway platform. <laughs> oh, so, okay. Uh, it was on the platform. I was thinking that you guys were in the car and you start talking and she goes, is that a snare drum right there? Break that out. And then you're <laughs> on the, the car jamming. That would be. No, 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 no. Okay. On the subway car. No, no, no. Yeah. On the platform. So right. when a subway comes through, I guess you keep playing. I don't even remember. This was. But, the, but you were open to all this. I mean, did you go yeah. to New York in 1994 with a game plan like, this is really what I want out of this city? Or was it just like going and following the creative muse and whatever opportunities came your way? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say I had like this solid plan. And I remember I was listening to your podcast with Sutter. Yeah. And I think you guys were talking about, you know, they don't really talk, teach you this, you know, in college about, you know what? you got to think about this when you, you know, move or something. I was just like, I'm going to move there. You know, I had a little bit of money, but you don't even think about, oh, you know, I need this much money. You just do it. And then I'm like, you know, we'll figure it out. And then Henry's like, well, I got this hookup. Maybe, you know, we can get this programming gig. So we have, you know, sort of a job. And then we just, you start meeting people. Sure. You know, and just start hey, let's play. And, you know, we were sort of jazz dudes. So doing like sessions, you know, jam sessions. And one of the first guys I met was Tim LaFave. Yeah. Like, we just got to play together. Finally, we played on a reggae record in Nashville. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. And now he's out here. We're both out here, but we, you know, we can't really visit just for the sake of visiting. Right, right. But, yeah. So... Tim's one of the oldest buds. I mean, literally weeks after moving there, I think I met him, but wow, yeah. what a great player. Yeah. So what was the first op? How is Henry now? Is he okay? What's he He's doing? He's great. Yeah. yeah. I swear we talk or text every other day or a couple times a week or something. Yeah. He would be a good guy to have on to talk about that particular point of view, you know, tickling the ivories for a living, you know? Oh my God. Yeah. And he's played, he's done everything. Yeah. You should, Definitely contact him. Yeah, I, I definitely will. So who, um, what was the first opportunity where you said to yourself, oh, okay, the wheels are in motion here. I'm getting paid to do this with somebody that actually recognizes this person's name on the marquee. Well, hmm. or well, I, it could be a funny story with somebody that happened to be in between busking and the first marquee job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, <laughs> so it seems like Henry started playing with blood, sweat, and tears. Mm. And back then, maybe more so, and I think they, they still do gigs, but yeah. it was like a good gig, especially for a horn, you know, it was a horn band. It was, you know, so it was a good gig. So Henry got that shortly after. And then I assume that was my connection. And then, although he and I never did it together, but I got to audition for the band and then I got the gig. And then we would go out, we would leave on a Friday and fly everywhere, you know, Friday night in Indiana, Saturday night, I swear, in L.A., <laughs> Sunday and night you're in like, Florida. And then you're like, McEvil, kick it off. Exactly. Holy cow. Yeah. So, you know, it's that and, you're, you know, but it's only weekends, usually Friday, Saturday. Friday, so you're Saturday, just Southwest Saturday. Airlines pointing it up, you know. No, continental. Continental. On, Every flight. So I was like a platinum member, you know, almost instantly because nice. every flight was, what is that, United now? Yeah, well, you walk on and they, they hand you a, a hot rag, a, a martini, <laughs> and a, 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 a sundae, a, you know, yes. ice cream sundae. Mr. Delaney. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so I guess that was like... That was, wow. yeah, well, the, the wheels were in motion there because, you know, it's really funny. I remember... My first marquee job in Nashville was with this gal named Pam Tillis, and her dad was Mel Tillis, Mel Tillis. and she had about 20 top 10 singles, which meant the people in the audience knew the words to the songs. We were, you and I were booked on a double bill, and I don't know, but you guys were before us oh. somewhere, and I, and I wanted to connect with you, but we never connected. There was some, you know, you probably had 15 guys in a, in a runner van that had to get back to the hotel or whatever, right. or whatever, oh and we didn't connect. And this would have been like... 2000 or 2001 
No, I'm sort of remembering. Isn't that crazy? Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm sort of remembering this now. I remember you pouring like a thing of water over your head because it was like during the summer or something. It must have been. And I, yeah. I mean, and I have a really, I have a okay. sensitive stomach. So those summer months of touring when it's 110 on stage Ooh, and yeah. there's pyro and 100% humidity, you're like. Sweaty cheese. I am going to have to take four <laughs> emodiums just to stop up oh. things. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now I'm remembering that. <laughs> <laughs> a modium was the trigger to remember everything. Sweaty yes, cheese. Exactly. Sweaty. So, so you start working with those cats, and then, you know, I love the whole thing about Buster Poindexter. I love the fact that David Johansson is David Johansson, the recording artist. Buster Poindexter, his uh, kind of like a alter ego, alter yeah. ego, and then originally, you know, a, a, a member, founding member of the New York Dolls, nineteen seventy one, and. It, You've worked with all three incarnations of that personality. And what's wild is, you know, plus he's an actor. Yeah. And look him up what movies he's been in. It's hilarious. Lots. Yeah. Um, but I actually met him through this great bass player, Kermit Driscoll, this great jazz bass player doing David Johansson had another band called the Harry Smiths. <laughs> That's right. And it was brushes, I swear, like brushes on a car piece of cardboard, just like old school. We would play like the bottom line or something in New York City. But just, you know, follow along, great band, just, you know, follow him, whatever he wants to do, you know. And it, it was a total blast. So he and I just got along great. And then when I think some Buster Poindexter gigs came up, you know, somehow I got the call for that. I don't know how I got through those gigs. But. And then when the New York Dolls, so they reformed the guy Morrissey, the singer, mm -hmm. huge New York Dolls fan. He got them to reunite in, I should know this, 2004? Yeah, 2004. And you played on that record. Uh, One day it will please us to remember, to remember even, even this. this. Yes. Yeah. Nice one. I went out. I remember when people were still selling records. I bought the record because my buddy that I went to school with, Brian, was playing on this record. I would try to keep up with everybody's body right. of work. Great stuff, man. Great job. Yeah, a total blast, you know. Um, and But it was funny because Morrissey got them back together. They did a big gig in London or whatever, but I didn't do that gig because Morrissey didn't know me. He knew that their drummer had passed away or whatever. Yeah. So they got this guy, Gary Powell, this great drummer in that. And then David Joe was like, hey, you know, there might be some gigs if you want to do them. Or as he does it, hey, Brian, you know, hey, there could be some great gigs, you know, whatever. So we did a few and then it just went on and on and we got, you know, did a few records and everything. What a blast. But yeah. man, that, that was not jazz. Well, let me, and, and you sounded great. There's videos all over the internet. You were a sonar guy at the time, right? Weren't you like playing sonar? Uh, DW, I want to say. Oh, okay, okay. I could have sworn that you and I were sonar guys at one point. So, but David just said, "Here, put on these tight leather pants and some chucks, and let's yeah. go." And Did you get this? You guys are always so well dressed. Did uh, Johnny Varvados or anybody come by and dress you? Did you get to keep the clothing? Yeah, he did come by a few times. Um, nice. Yeah, I was rocking the guy liner at times. Um, yeah. Uh. Yeah, it was a blast. Oh, so fun, man. Yeah, no, that had to be great. And so um, what's, what would be, uh, now you, you have like a little bit of like a, some bullet points you gave me. And one of them, it says, computer nerd. <laughs> is, is that the day job for you? Or, is, what, or what do you think? Well, and again, going back to referencing your other interviews with Jay, uh, Jason Sutter, where he's really into what, like real estate and art and stuff. I've always been like a Mac and computer nerd, you know? Right. And so, and I've been learning like programming, like JavaScript and PHP, you know, a lot of sexy words like that, oh HTML. <laughs> For a long WYSIWYG. time. Yeah, WYSIWYG. Wow, there we go. That's right. Um, see, Jim knows. I mean, can you uh, design a website from scratch? 
I can. That's Damn, scary. that's a good skill set. That using, you can, that's using Word one. or um, nothing but HTML coding? Yes. I wow. Use, I use Microsoft's Visual Studio. Visual you remember Studio the days code. of front page? Wow, front page. How about uh, Netscape? Oh, yeah, Navigator. I started with, with front page back in the day. Front page, wow. Yeah. Microsoft front page, design my own websites, and they were yeah. awful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the drummers are loving this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and since this pandemic thing, you know, there are no gigs or anything. So I've been learning more and more about JavaScript and uh, APIs and... Again. So, but then, but then you, but but then you have to be able to, like, put it to use. So, if you've been working for a company, or are you a freelancer, or a consultant, or how does it? Yeah, I guess I'm a consultant with this music company that I also do private events with. Nice. So they have a like a program that keeps track of everything. I didn't do that program, but I help out on a technical side with them a lot. That's so, good. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, so, I mean, that, cause we talk about that all the time. Like, you know, our, and our friend, Nick Graffini, who has, you know, great drummer sure. podcast, drummer's resource. He's always talking about what's the deal. <laughs> he doesn't say like, he doesn't say like that, but what's the deal with, you know, drummers saying, um, you know, I only want to play the drums and if I have to do anything else, I'm not a success. Wow. I mean, wow. it's really, uh, you know, you got to eat. And, um, you know, if you want to have the good Chuck Taylors, you know, the $80 Chuck Taylors, you got to right. have a little, a little side hustle always helps. Otherwise, you're just a slave to waiting for that phone to ring. If you have some of these other skill sets, you can make the phone ring. Right, right, right. So Which I've been, yeah, working on that more and more. But of course, I, I feel like, yeah, I've always been wanting to work and work. So I do Broadway shows. I sub on those. I do. Oh, so... Which ones do you sub for? So I was, I subbed that Spider Man nice. when that was around. Killer. Um, I was subbing on Mean Girls. Oh, nice. And Moulin Rouge before this whole thing, you know, the pandemic, yeah. the plague. Uh, there was a, a show, Waitress, that closed oh, yeah. right before um, all this hit. But. What a blast, you know. Yeah, you know, we just had on Sammy Marandino, Warren Odds, uh, Odes, sorry, Odes. and uh, Sean McDaniel. So, like, wow. three different types of, of Broadway players. And yeah. I know there was so many guys, you know, you know, Andres and everybody we could have on. But I was like, you know, with Zoom, it's hard to manage uh, – the multiple personalities, but it was great because they all had such unique insights about the Broadway thing. And Sammy was like, you know, hey, Rich, if you lived in New York or Connecticut, you'd be subbing for me. And I'd be like, yeah, but woo. I mean, the work just mentally, you have to be able to maintain psychologically what you need to be able to do with that show because the phone call could come at four in the afternoon and the show's at what, eight? And you're like, can you play yeah, for me yeah. tonight? And yeah. you got to like pull out your charts and notes and Woo. How do you, yeah. how do you keep all the shows fresh? What do you do just once a week? Kind of like look at the notes. Yeah. And it does seem like if you get into rotation enough, you can sort of keep it fresh, but I will definitely, if it's been over a week, 10 days, I'll sort of go through it, you know, the tempos and everything, you know, cause yeah. you're really trying to go in and sound like the other drummer, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's it's crazy, and I can understand why some people can just be scared to death and nervous and like, oh, my God, I can't do it. Like the pressure, you know, you have the conductor staring at you and like, what are you doing? Um, but it's a blast. You, know, you just got to get through those first few shows. And, yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, because there the responsibilities are fierce. I mean, because I know nowadays with the music being more and more modern, not only do they want you to sound like the other guy, but you might have to trigger Ableton and clicks, and then there's specific yep. pads. I mean, Sammy's got pads and pedals, and yeah. you have to rehearse those orchestrations, so a lot of big boy stuff going on. And then you might have to double on hand drums, orchestral percussion. It's got to be part of your setup. Yeah. You got to be able to read the music and look at the conductor as much as humanly possible. So, I mean, and these play someone else's kit. You know, think about that. You know, yeah. I mean, sometimes. Can you move I, the stuff or no? 
Try not to. Ish, you know, some Ish. guys, you know, are maybe cooler about, or I try to move it, you know, and I'll, or I'll put a piece of tape down where the snare drum is or whatever, so I move it back or whatever. But yeah, it can be. I had tough. a question I'd, for both of you. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. When yeah. you sit down at somebody else's kit, what scenario of that kit makes you go, oh my gosh, I have no idea how you play this thing? Snare yeah, angle? It, yeah, snare Snare height. angle, seat height? Snare yep. height, yeah. Like one dude, yeah, would sit really high. And yeah. I don't know if I sit low. I don't know, but... I, 90 degree angle on the knee kind of thing, or... <laughs> the play... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I just have the snare flat... <sighs> I don't know, but yeah, sometimes it's very difficult. Yeah. And I said, I, my brother, yeah. my brother's is in a tribute band up in Detroit, and drummer's not bad. He's not great, but he's not bad. Um, and he's got like the toms are set up like how a beginner eight year old would set up the toms. Oh, um, like facing you? Yeah, they're facing you, and they're like two feet apart. <laughs> He just never know. changed his groove, man. I don't know. But that's how it came in the box, all set up. Right? <laughs> that's how I saw it in the music store in the window. No, I said, <laughs> I said guitar player set all up. the way low. on The, oh, the lowest yeah. the throne can go pretty much. And then my snare drum is facing me like Phil Collins, Liberty DeVito, oh, Kenny wow. Aronoff. It's like, not like, like that, but it, there, there's no. an angle so I can whack that rim shot. And then over the years, I've tried to change my, my evil ways. And I, you just can't teach an old dog to tricks. I, I mean, what about, just, I mean, wouldn't it make sense to point it away from you because your hand comes down and whacks I, the snare drum? I would catch all rim. That, I mean, nothing would you? but right. rim. Unless, it would have to be really like, low. Wouldn't Car doesn't Carlock sort of do that? Yeah. I never so learned does, that grip. Um, You're a match grip yeah, player. Uh, I never learned yeah, traditional. Match. Yeah, I can't do tradition. I don't know how you get power on the back. Yeah. With. And you got Suckerman who plays that way, but his snare drum's up around his nipples. Yeah. Yeah, but clearly those guys make it work. <laughs> Something oh is going gosh. on there, yeah. I remember Carlock, our buddy Keith Carlock, kind of running around the practice rooms in North Texas with this giant weird growth on his hands. And we were like, what is that? He was developing this giant callus right in there where the, right, right. like right in there. Stuart Copeland would tape it up as well because, hey, whack. Right. Oh, my God. Insane. Wow. I, do you have any battle scars, drumming battle scars? Like for me, like on my inner thigh, no hair grows. I'm like, I look like a hairless cat there from my hand hitting my leg. For I, I yeah, need, sure, that's didn't what Didn't need from. to know that. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> no, on, and, wow, you just made me think of it. So on my right leg, yeah, that's where I warm up. Like I don't have a practice pad, like on a gig. Like right. So if I'm, we're about to play, I'll sit there and I'll, do that 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 on my right leg. So there's like calluses on my leg near my knee. Anyway, that's from it's your like jazz right simple letter. warm up pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check a duck, check a duck, check a duck, check a duck, do check a do check a do check a Yeah, yeah. And but plenty of New York dolls. There were battle scars like just you know you hit your finger. Or you hit the side of your head somehow and you start yeah. bleeding and whatever. Yeah, the Try one that happens is where you, you're, you're like, you get a knuckle or a pinky oh. on the yeah. hi hat. Right, right, right. right. And oh, just blood all over the heads and everything. But, but the people love that, right? Oh, God, the more no. blood, the better. Yeah. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self employed, especially musicians, think home ownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven year journey. If you're a self employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. NMLS number one four six five nine four eight. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS number three nine one seven nine. NMLS consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to bigdotlighting.com. 
Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So in between all this, I was familiar with a lot of these gigs. When did Patty Austin, when did that happen? When was that? Good question. Um, You're going to have to get this I, together for your memoir, yeah, your, exactly. your, your bi biopic. Memoir. I think I subbed a bunch of this, this drummer, Brian Dunn. Do you know mm -hmm. this guy? Another BD. He did the gig a lot, and I think I subbed for him a few times with Tim LaFave, you know, and it was like jazz stuff. It was great. And she's the coolest. Yeah. That was a blast, yeah. So what are the common out between all the different gigs that you've done? What, for the younger kids or the guys that want to work more, what's the common out, what's the thread in being a working drummer is like – what did you take away from that 25 years of working with all this stylistic diversity? Yeah, I guess playing the gig the way it's supposed to be played. Like, yeah. um, and it even took me like the New York Dolls gig. I mean, that's freaking rock and roll. It's punk rock. I mean, you play fucking hard, you know? <laughs> and I, I know it, it even took me a second, I think, to get the chops up. You know, and look at, look at some of those videos. <laughs> it's nuts, you know, just like full, you know, arm backbeats. And Love that. that. Um, but the Melissa thing, you know, is, is certainly there's excitement and everything. You know, you're playing in front of 20,000, 30,000 people, but it's a different kind of vibe, you know. So play that gig, you know, that way. I do these private parties. We do like four on the floor dance stuff. Play it the four on the floor, you know, keep it simple, play the right groove, you know. Don't be all this Vinny shit. I mean, obviously Vinny's the greatest ever. I just can't do that at all. So if I do that, I'll destroy the groove, you know. So yep. I just try to play the right feel, the right everything for the tune, you know. Yeah. Even you do singer songwriter stuff, you know, is it mellow is it supposed to be edgy is it supposed to be rock you know play it the right way you know yeah be, be be stylistically appropriate now i'm looking at your studio here some people are consuming this with their ears if you're watching this there's a bunch of guitars and basses and probably synths and stuff so did you over the last 25 years teach yourself how to do all that stuff for composing or do you have all your all your friends come over Mm, I don't have friends. No, <laughs> they, no, no they don't. No, I they just don't hire help. my friends. Yeah. No, I think I gathered some of this stuff, and I try to play a little bit. And yeah. I, I don't compose per se. Uh, I do some production and stuff. I have some keyboards, you know, to add in some. And I have the music knowledge from North Texas about right. cor chords and scales and. You know, so I can add in some stuff. But yeah, I mean, I just think that if I had the ability to pick up an electric guitar and I felt that 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 um, that rush, and if I experienced that mobility of being able to take this musical phallic symbol and just like Whoa. shred in front of all these attractive people, would I would never go back behind the drums ever right, again. Right. I think so, we have a new photo album idea that you could do. What's that? Me carrying guitar, guitar poses, guitar poses that you could strike. Oh God, I've already got like a yeah. uh, definitely a book full of those. Yeah, do with you? my tennis racket. I had to go do the uh, an audition the other day to play a dad type tennis player for a pharmaceutical oh commercial, gosh. and they asked me what my what my experience was, was with playing tennis, and I said play it all the time, pretending to be an electric guitar, and they oh. thought that was kind of funny. The phone hasn't rang. I don't think I booked oh. that one. I think they need somebody that actually plays tennis, but the agent was like, or they want to see you anyway. So it's like, 
What a weird thing, Brian, to, to pretend well, to like be dads and tennis players <laughs> and, and like weird uncles and like it's so weird fun. uncles. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it's so specific. Sometimes you'll, you'll answer these like casting calls. It's like looking for somebody that owns an eight foot unicycle, looking for <laughs> hula hoop experts, um, you know, but if they're looking for someone who's like dark skinned, five, seven, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I lie and tell them that I'm five eight. Okay, so that that's cool. Broadway shows. What was this thing that you sent about about the David Bowie thing? What was that? Okay, so he did this off Broadway thing. So in New York, I guess off Broadway usually means it's not as pop. You know, the all the kids from on vacation from Florida or whatever are not going to come see an off Broadway. They they want to see Mean Girls and the big. Yeah, you know the big shows. These are usually smaller theaters, but he did this show called Lazarus. Um, really out there, you know, conceptually and everything. But he was involved, and Henry Hay was the music director of it. You know, so he's like, Brian, do you want to do this show? I'm like, hell yeah! If Bowie's and he was there, Bowie was at some of the rehearsals and nice. stuff. And this was right before he passed away. And that show ran for like six weeks mm. in the East Village and he passed away towards the end of the run, you know, like mm. complete shocker. But it was just so cool, you know, to the music. There's a record out there with Lazarus, which is Mark Julian on drums and Lafave on bass it's killer amazing but um so we did some of that music and then but bowie was you know hanging around i remember i had like the plexiglass cage Sneeze around guard. me yeah exactly because it was like a small theater and we're playing you know it's not hard but it, you know you still gotta sort of lay into it you know because it's rock stuff and I remember him being on the other side, like during rehearsals. He's like, Brian, do you have a cowbell? I want to play along, whatever. I'm like, That's my British accent. So. <laughs> that was good. Anyway, but, you know, David Bowie wanted to play cowbell with me. So think about that. That's right. You'd get him a cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> get him a hey, cowbell. You're like. <laughs> he, he puts his pants What's... on one leg at a time yeah, like exactly. the rest of them. Exactly. What's the Tommy Lee LP cowbell? The Ridge Rider. Did you get him a Ridge Rider or oh, did you get him like a wow. real bell? I didn't get him either because I didn't have one. So anyway. Okay, gotcha. I failed. Anyway. Uh, Rich, have you ever broken a Ridge Rider? No. I could see you doing that. I've broken the sticks that you use on the Ridge Rider for sure. Yeah. Do you break cymbals? I don't break a lot, but they will crack occasionally just because I try to use glancing blows. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the sw a nice swipe. Swish. That you know, make Ed so proud, you know. But oh. just you know, and I, and I, and they're and they're very loose, so they can right. sway like palm trees. Um, but sometimes just the you know, just the wear and tear, man. No, with the New York Dolls, I would break symbols regularly. Did you have to crank them down so they're like Tommy Lee stiff? No, no. no. <laughs> Brian would never do that. It's he's all about oh the tone, man. Yeah. yeah. No, I would I would break ride symbols. Crash symbols, hi hat symbols, yeah. We what was your favorite? Bass? Yeah. Yeah. What did I use then? Yeah. I think you were using one up and one down, one up and two down. Sure. No, no, five B sticks. I mean, oh, regular. What? Yeah. <laughs> Nerd alert! What? Um, well, yeah, we're what, talking uh, drum stuff here. Why yeah, not? I mean, stick it, size, stick size. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Two Bs? I mean, oh, big, you, you made the, the journey to the two. Those are big, man. Yeah, those but are like now, tree stumps. Now I use extreme five A's a lot with the Vic Firth. Yeah. Except if it's super heavy, I use the extreme five Bs. Nice. Or the 55 A's, which are slightly between the... Anyway. Yeah, I fried the, I tried the two Bs uh, when I was in this band, Rush Low, 2003, 2004. It was just, it was a fun experiment, but then I went right back to the five Bs. And, you know, when you play the little Spangle line gigs, there's nothing like a little Erskine, you oh, know, yeah. tiny yeah. tip, you know. Yeah, and there's a, Vic Firth makes these David Garibaldi sticks that are super small, and I've been, I use those for, like, jazz stuff. Nice. Mm -hmm. it's, oddly enough, 
but they feel great. Or the Erskins, you know. Yeah. Now, with all this under your belt, so accomplished, I mean, you went after this thing, you checked this box, you checked ba- that box, touring, rock stars, great recordings, you can hear yourself on the radio, you've seen yourself on TV, you've done Broadway. Anything else on the bucket list? I mean, we're still young. We got another 20, 30 years, maybe, if we take care of ourselves and have our green smoothies. Sure. Um, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just to keep doing it, you know, yeah. um, would love to tour a lot. I know with Melissa, it was mainly U.S., and that was the last big touring thing. I mean, yeah. we did go to... I guess we went to Australia, but with the New York Dolls, it was like Europe, Europe, occasional United States, Europe, Europe. We went to Russia, went to Israel, we went to Japan, China. You know, it was incredible. I would love to do that, you know, again, yeah. touring, but um, recording, I love recording. There's some great, you know, I don't know if there's the scene like there is in Nashville or L.A., um, but I always love recording. Yeah. I love home recording, needless to say. You do that a lot from your place, right? Yeah. You crank, cranking yeah. out the files for folks? Yeah. Cause, and I've had a setup for, wow, six, seven years or so. Mm-hmm. But over the last year, man, I've put in even more money and, you know, mics and preamps and all yeah. kinds of buzzwords. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got, I, I, I think I've been set up for, for, for 10 years at my little spot in Nashville and it started just very, uh, you know, just, you know, make sure that you can capture the good sound. It's all in your hands, put some fresh heads on there. You know how to tune the drums. You can put a 57 on there. It's going to sound good. But I, you know, the next step for me, I'm not going to float floors. I'm not going to do any of that crazy stuff. I'm just going to put more money into really much better microphones and really much better pre's. And that's, you know, really where the stinks sink your money. Right, right, right. And I think, People hear sometimes with their ears the li- or hear with their ears. <laughs> they hear with, with the list of, of, of gear you yeah, have. Yeah, Neve and API, if you say that stuff. Yeah. If, as long as they know what that is. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't list any of that stuff. I just say, hey, look, it, this, is, this is what it sounds like. Yeah. You like it? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're hired. Good, because they yeah. don't want to know what the gear is. Yeah. Because mine is just base entry-level stuff. So that would be the next step is to beef up that kind of stuff. But like right <laughs> before this call, a guy texted me. He's like, hey, I got another track. It's a producer who's hired me for a bunch of stuff. He's like, yeah. hey, I got another track. Let me know when you're available. You know, so yeah. great. Love yeah, it. and isn't it crazy trying to come up with a price point that works for everybody, but it doesn't oh. like you don't waste your time. You get paid for your time and talent, and you're like, well, my other friend and colleague is charging this much, and my other friend and colleague, you know, and just trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. So Jim is going to get some water. That's kind of like a Melissa Etheridge song. Not get oh. some water. I have to let off some water. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, he is aging, so... It does happen. I feel like I'm up at least two days. times a night these days. It's like, oh, yeah, you can almost set your watch to it. It's like uh, two in the morning, maybe six in the morning. And my bus is very busy because we're like, you know, we're older guys. And it's so that the door to the front lounge is always opening and closing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I love that. I miss that. It was like all these years, 16 years nonstop touring every year, and then one wow. year we're not, we don't do it. And so you miss getting up and smelling the coffee in the morning and converging in the front lounge and talking about watching a little CNN and, oh, right, right. I can't right. wait. Yeah, it's, I remember the last big tour I did, I mean, was it two or three months straight with Melissa? And obviously you, you look back and you're like, oh, this is so great. But you know, the sleep you get is not always great, you know, and sometimes I remember coming back from that, you know, I hadn't seen my family in forever and I'm, but I was so wiped out. It's like, oh my God, I even think I went to the doctor because I was just so dehydrated. Fried. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Fried, you know, so, but I look back on it. I'm like, so great, you know, just the hang, you know, David Santos. I mean, That's right. On. You guys played together. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, Melissa is the greatest, so it's a blast, you know, all those touring. Is there more coming with that when it opens back up, maybe? Not with Melissa, because I stopped doing that in 2018, I think. Oh, okay. I think just to stick, stay around New York, I had some 
you know, th- some of these Broadway opportunities, you know, again, as, as a sub, but then some recording, some like repeated recording studio things that were yeah. very good. So our tax it? guys hate us because we have like uh, 500 different revenue streams um, and, and, and they're like, how much to do my taxes? Like, and they're like, dude, this that's is why they love consuming. you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they love you. Yeah. yeah. I got tax bills from like five years ago. I'm still trying to pay off. Yeah. Um, hey, the, the one thing about the Broadway thing I was going to ask, what is the, what is your favorite play that you like performing in these days? And what do you think is the most popular at the moment? And when things get back on, on track? Yeah. Well, I never did Hamilton, but that's of course the big, uh, that's the that's, big, that's the new I'm, rent. Yeah. I'm sure the drummer who I don't know, I've met him, but um, I'm sure he just gets hammered with people like, hey, do you need a sub? Because I've done mm. that. I've contacted, you know, a bunch of drummers like when this was all going on, you know, every once in a while, you just put the feelers out, you know, you're like, hey, you're looking for a sub every once in a while, you know, something could, the guy would be like, yeah, well, you know, one of my guys could usually, they'll have like four or five subs. Um, so maybe one of those drummers got his own show or something. So if you just happen to dial in at the right time. But um, I did that show Waitress, uh, and that was a blast. Uh, Sarah Bareilles did the music. Uh, nice. Uh, that was a blast. Um, Spider-Man. You know, well, well, the one that sounds really fun is my daughter got me into it was uh, Dear Evan Hansen. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. I have not heard that stuff or I haven't played it, but. I know it's yeah. very popular. Yeah, popular Going with those kids. Back, buddy. Who was? Who are your Mount Rushmore drum drum influences? Well, I, I know I got, uh, got into Weckl heavy because he was a St. Louis guy. Yeah, that's right. And he's he's definitely older than I. But I mean, he's got to be twenty years older than me, right? No, sorry. <laughs> Ten. I don't, yeah. I don't know, but. He was, and I remember being a uh, Chick Corea freak and right. the electric band. I mean, when that first album came out, I was like, oh, my God. And I tried to play that stuff. Never could. But I got to see them a few times in St. Louis. I remember even getting to hang out with Weckl. So my drum teacher in St. Louis, Kevin Giannino, this great teacher, one time he called me when I was home. It must have been like a Christmas break from school. He's like, hey, Dave is in town playing like a trio gig at this uh, hotel or something. You know, maybe come check it out. And so I went to see him and it was this guy, Jay Oliver, great keyboard player, and Tom Kennedy, unbelievable bass player. Wow. If, you, if you look mm. these guys up, you know, they always play together. Um, then... Afterward, you know, I got to meet Dave and that, and then they said, Dave was like, well, we're going to go to Jay's studio at his home nearby if you want to come and just hang out. So they started there at like 1 a.m., you know, just they go over there just to hang out and play even more. So I'm there for hours, like checking out these guys, just jamming and recording. It was the most unbelievable thing. You know, again, I was such a weckle guy um yeah we all went through that stage i, m- I remember carlock you know walking around campus in like weckle pants and i had like i had the weckle haircut hair? i had the hair i had the yeah. weckle hair and the jeff Percaro glasses wow <laughs> oh yeah why are you laughing anyway um, <laughs> wow yeah i guess weckle i mean all those all those drummers Percaro. uh should we get it to Beaufort, Carter? No. Or Carter Beaufort. That was one of Jim's guys. Jim's younger than us. Yeah. He's, you know, he's, yeah. he's the fountain of youth over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I look older than both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can I play my sound effect? But a psh, yeah, um, please do. Uh, my family loves it when I do that. Um, no. Uh, there we go. Sort of heard it. So, so what? What about your fam? You you got kids? Are they interested in music? No. 
they don't they're not interested I, and you're like this I, is great i don't have to talk them off the ledge yeah, yeah. i have a nine and a 14 year old wow and the 14 year old likes music she's listens to some really cool stuff but and sings a bit but you know and we never like forced any like lessons like piano or violin or anything uh calliope or um <laughs> accordion no and the nine-year-old he he's got the super long blonde hair he is a rock star but does is not into music i swear in the least wow, wow. yeah so and and i never met your bride how, how long you kids been together how'd you guys meet oh, where she we've <laughs> been the married 20 something that's, years that's great yeah i met her at a gig always that that happens that's the story <laughs> okay. a bar or a gig <clears throat> and she'll probably cringe me telling the story but hold on let me sit the moment there we go so i walked in I, I, I was playing it was a band called dead left and it was like a rock band and she came by she was working at a coffee shop. She smelled of coffee. And she was with her brother-in-law. And the brother-in-law's brother was the lead singer in this band. <sighs> this is in 1997. Anyway. So, yeah. So you got married. You were a youngster. Yeah, we got married in 2000. Yeah. That's good, and you can, and you're gone for three months at a time, and you can keep it happening, and that is great. Twenty-one right. years. Yeah, I think. I could do I math. Think, yeah, you're yeah. good at that. Thank you. I think the road thing the is. Yeah. I think the road Gosh. thing is good. You know. Yeah, because absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. I mean, if you're on top of each other twenty-four-seven, a little break here and there. Like if things get tense in my household, I just go for a run, and then when I come back, like yeah. the, it's like the clouds have cleared. Yeah, I, I remember you're a runner. I've been doing that more and more since the pandemic. Yeah, I try to do what five, six miles every other day. That's good. Oh yeah, yeah. I can't, I've got my my uh, Nike running app, and I thought I was like the coolest guy ever because I'm like, so I got this app, and it keeps track of my. And everyone's like, yeah, everyone's got that, dude. Um, but it's 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 like a good it's good like knowledge is power. It's like wow, I ran I ran a 800 miles during COVID, you know. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, if I didn't run those 800 miles, I would look like Alfred Hitchcock's Presents, you know. I mean, it's right. like it's it's What's good. What's wrong with that? <laughs> and the problem is I've been I've been eating the amount of calories you burn <laughs> well hey your wife is an immense cook that's true she's great she um, really is yeah. but yeah talk about running in New York so I've gone out when it's 17 degrees out I'll run if it's 90 degrees out I'll run you know it's just if it's snowing and icy I don't run but right yeah, you don't want to slip. And, 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 and So I forget, what borough are you in? Are you outside the city? So we're outside of the city now. Westchester. Yeah. North nice. of the city. Yeah. You in White Plains doing some uh, Armonk? Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> in that hood, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, what's on the books today, man? You got to crank out a file for somebody? You got to learn some songs? Yeah, I was working on a tune for Henry that he's nice. producing. That's all I can say. It's it's a secret. Uh, There's an NDA attached to this. Yep. So working on that, and then what else? Yeah. Some other another guy contacted me last night, so I'm going to start working on his tune. And yeah, are you looking back? Um, do you feel like um, New York changed you for the better? Is your th is your th skin thicker? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, plus getting older. Um, Get off my the, lawn. Yeah, yeah. I, I just remember, I mean, I like to feel like I'm getting better at this, but yeah. Uh, you know, you're in your 30s and that, and you feel like you know what you're doing. And if people are constantly making, well, do this, do this, and then you take it personally, and it's just so stupid. I look back sometimes, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, if I was being a pain about, oh, I don't want to change that. It feels right, you know. But, you know, 
they didn't want that. So why didn't I just change? You know, yeah, I just yeah. look back sometimes. You know, so I feel like as I've gotten older, I'm just taking better it as about. It comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's killer. Yeah. Jim, Jim's favorite part yeah. of the show: the random question oh, no. of the day. It's the random question. Random question. Random question of the day. Brian, if you could put out a magazine, what would you name it and what would be in it? <laughs> Next question. Um, uh, Just naked Max. No. Golden Retrievers Behind the Drums. <laughs> do you own a Golden Retriever? Yeah, yes. Oh, that's your, that's your dog of choice? Yes. What's the dog's right. name? Cody. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Sorry, did that come anywhere close? Dude, to there's calendars with cats doing all sorts yeah, of weird that, things. That could work. So, yeah. That could totally be a calendar. Yeah. Dogs and drums. Dogs and drums. That's awesome. So, Brian. There's a, there's a thing. I may actually what, steal uh, that idea. Thank you. Jim, Jim can make it happen. We know photographers. Yeah. Um, how do you like to be found? Do you like to be found on the World Wide Web? <laughs> World Wide Web. Yeah. Um, Instagram, what is it? B Delaney NY. Um, or I'm on the Facebooks. Uh, the did Twitters. you design a website for yourself? I did, Rachel. but there was some kind of technical issue a few months ago. So I just had the website forward to my Instagram right now. So, mm -hmm. but while I work on the fancy WYSIWYG, HTML website <laughs> with videos on Wix. Of, yeah, yeah. With you make it retrievers. On, yeah. Make it on Wix.com. Yes. B Delaney NY. That's Instagram. good. Everybody, yeah. yeah. Everybody so hit people, Brian up. Yeah, he'll yeah. get back with you. You had try to answer questions when like there's some young kids that are like, I noticed that your ride symbol is and I mean, I try to yeah, answer. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's always and fun. I'm gonna try to put up more and more videos of the home studio here. Yeah. You know. It looks hot. It's got it's got a lot of musician friendly colors, black and gray. Oh yes, yeah, I love it. It's dead, yeah, man. This was so insightful, man. And, and please say hi to Henry for me, and maybe I can reconnect with him. It's just been embarrassingly way too long, but I just feel like I'm at a point in my life where I re I want to reconnect with some figures of my youth with, and you yeah. included. It was. I'm just so glad. You went to New York and you just made all your dreams come true and you're still doing it, man. And still so doing it, yeah. congratulations, man. Thank you, sir. Henry has a great podcast. Look for his podcast. Wait, what is it called? I think it's called The Right Key. Oh, that is smart. It's like a dad joke, but for a keyboard player, oh, it, that works oh. out. I have to try to avoid the dad jokes because I am of that age. Oh. But uh, man, thank you, man. And, and I'll let you, you know when this comes out and you can share it with your brood. Of course. Thank you, sir. Yes. What a what a blast. Absolutely, man. And hey, to all the listeners out there, Jim and I had an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And this is a, a sincere plea. Please subscribe, share, rate, and review. It really helps us. Right now, we got a five-star rating. Very proud of us, Jim. This is almost like two years in the making. we got about 110 episodes. So thank you guys for listening and consuming this. And uh, yeah, come back for the good stuff. We'll be here, and we'll see you next time. Brian, thanks, man. Thank you, sir. What a blast. Yeah. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.